as Rob said, thank you for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, we were scheduled for about a 60 minute presentation. Um, not uh, presentation wouldn't be a full 60 minutes. We'll have some time for chat at the end. Uh, look, yeah, it looks like everyone's hearing me good, which is which is great. Uh, so I'm going to turn my camera off just while I'm presenting, and then I'll turn it back on once we once we get into uh, into the Q and A section. All right. So as Rob mentioned, there'll be a recording of of uh, this presentation available. You can certainly check it out. Uh, or let uh, let anyone that you think might be interested in it uh, know that it will be available, uh, and Rob will send information out on that uh, once the once the session is done this morning. So, kind of a quick overview of what we're going to look at today. Uh, going to start by just having a quick overview of musculoskeletal injuries. Going to talk about some common concerns we hear as it relates to driving and operating heavy equipment. Um, we're going to talk about how to get set up properly for driving. Um, also discussing our inspection at the beginning of our day. There's some opportunities there uh, to reduce our risk of injury and talk briefly about manual handling. And then uh, kind of the final section, we'll be just talking about uh, some things to consider if you are purchasing new fleet vehicles. Um, you know, one of the things we um, quite often find when we're doing vehicle assessments is you know we're either missing a feature there's a feature we'd like to have that maybe is is not in the current piece of equipment that uh, that an individual has and really the opportunity for for acquiring those features is during during acquisition so um you know i i think um you know giving some thought and, and asking the operators what what does and doesn't work for them before purchasing new equipment is really important so we'll, we'll spend uh, just a couple minutes talking about that towards the end as well all right, well, we will get right into it. Uh, these, this series of talks is really aimed at reducing our risk for musculoskeletal injuries. And, um, and uh, musculoskeletal injuries, sometimes referred to as musculoskeletal disorders, MSDs or MSIs, they are injuries that involve muscles, tendons, nerves, ligaments, joints, and other soft tissues. Uh, so really we're talking soft tissue injuries to the body. And these are generally um injuries that occur over time they're they're kind of wear and tear type injuries so when we look at the risk factors associated with that uh we break those into sort of items associated with what we're doing and, and the task and then our personal risk factors and we can see there's a number of a number of risk factors that we're concerned with uh, the primary ones that we're looking at are certainly force posture repetition and duration and then there's a number of, of, of secondary risk factors that, that apply to that. And then we also have individual risk factors or personal risk factors that we need to be uh, concerned with and or aware of, I should say. And really, that could be things like what kind of physical condition we're in, our ability to do work, uh, our size and stature has an impact on that. Uh, we've had a previous injury before. So uh, as much as there's things we want to control at an organizational level around what people are doing, uh, people have uh, an impact on that as well. So um, when we look at those, for those of you that are not familiar with AMSHA's uh, MSI campaign, there are a number of resources available. Uh, and uh, the resources certainly provide information on the different risk factors and how we can go about reducing those. Uh, there are toolbox talks that are available. There are different posters that talk about these risk factors. Um, so I'm not going to spend a, a ton of time talking about those here. Uh, Rob will have uh, in his email post talk, uh, he'll have links to where you can see some of those resources that are available. Um, but as I said, with each of these risk factors, it's looking at what the risk factor is, what really we're looking to do in terms of uh, reducing or eliminating that as a concern. Okay, and we'll talk to some of these specific to, to driving and vehicle setup here as, as the talk goes. I just wanted to give you a sense of uh, what, what the campaign looks at and, and what some of those resources might be. 
All right. And as we get into uh, summer again, hopefully, uh, you know, temperature, hopefully warm temperatures, not cool temperatures are going to be uh, uh, something we want to be aware of as we get into uh, the warmer weather, uh, whether we're whether we're in a vehicle or outside doing work more likely. Um, where, where warm temperatures become of concern as it relates to musculoskeletal injuries is um, the risk of dehydration. And as we if we become dehydrated, uh, our muscle function is not as good. Uh, it doesn't work the way it's intended to, and we can you know, have other health issues that come, come along with that. So um, certainly something to be aware of as we get into the warmer months. So when we look at MSIs, We've talked about some of the risk factors. Next thing I want to talk about briefly is what are our signs and symptoms? And if you look at this, at this list, as you go down the list, essentially um, the, uh, how far we're into a musculoskeletal injury, and we'll talk about the stages here on our next slide, uh, is becoming progressively more. So we start with some discomfort, some tenderness, burning, uh, burning feeling, redness. When we get into swelling, when we get into numbness and tingling or restricted range of movement or loss of strength, we've gone quite a bit down the path of, of having this MSI. Um, th those things don't start right away. Usually we have some warning signs in, in terms of discomfort. And um, one of the biggest things I do anytime I'm doing this type of training is to encourage people to pay attention to those warning signs before we get into swelling, numbness and tingling, restricted range of movement or loss of strength. For some people, it takes to that point where uh, that's what really catches their attention and then they want to do something about it. But really with MSIs, the earlier we seek uh, help and some treatment, the less likely we are to get into kind of those last three items. Um, and we really want to um, want to have people look get those things looked at sooner rather than later. If we look at the stages of MSIs, there's basically uh, three, three stages. Initially, we're feeling, you know, uh, discomfort, uh, and we typically get it uh, associated with a particular task or posture that we're in. When we stop doing that, or we get out of that posture, usually it gets better. Uh, and that can go on for quite some time. Stage two, uh, a, the discomfort makes it such that it's difficult for us to perform tasks. And the onset of symptoms is quicker and the symptoms going away is slower. So it's, it's becoming kind of more and more of our time. And then the, the third stage is symptoms are always there regardless of what we're doing. Uh, it has an impact on our sleep, our activities at home, and the recovery is not as, not as good and it could certainly take a lot longer. So th this is kind of, this slide really illustrates the importance of getting those things looked at uh, sooner rather than later. So we don't get into stage two and stage three. So kind of the final slide, I'll talk about uh, MSIs and then we'll get into the specifics of today's topic, which is around um, uh, vehicle setup for driving and, and heavy equipment use, is to get you to think about how injuries occur. And I said MSIs are really wear and tear type injuries. They develop over time. And um, if you think of this red line at the top as your tissue, uh, is your tissue's capacity. So that could be muscle, it could be a, uh, could be a ligament, could be a tendon, any, any soft tissue in our body. And essentially the blue line at the bottom is the, the work or the, or the demand that's being placed on that. So you know, if we kind of go left to right, we're sitting upright in a nice posture the demand on our tissue is very light and that really has no impact on our tissues capacity. If we slouch forward and we're bent all day, you know, uh, looking over paperwork and we're not in a great posture, uh, the demand on our tissues is higher and you can see that the capacity kind of decreases as a result of that. If we get into some whole body work, whether that's sweeping or raking or doing yard work, like we, we might do this time of year, you can see that the demand kind of goes up and down, but it's, it's, it's certainly higher because uh, we've got some whole body movement and you can see that the tissues capacity decreases there much quicker because we're putting putting higher demands on it. As we rest, you know, if you get uh, six, seven, eight hours of sleep, uh, our tissues capacity uh, recovers a bit and we get, uh, you know, we, we, the capacity. Basically, at a certain point, if you're the demand that you're putting on the tissue 
um, will at a certain point meet the capacity. And when those two lines meet, we have an injury. So how that line looks varies depending on the individual, varies on what we're doing and varies on the tissue itself. But you get the idea is, you know, if you put more demand and you don't give it enough rest, at a certain point we have, have an injury. And, um, you know, demands or activities that are more physical that put us in a more non-neutral posture, uh, put greater demand on the tissue's capacity and, and, you know, increase the risk of those two lines meeting. Um, so that's just kind of to get you thinking about what, what increases our risk of a musculoskeletal injury and kind of what the mechanism of that looks like at, uh, at sort of a high level. You know, quickly, if we look at some stats from, from AMSHA members here, uh, we look at the percentage of claims by occupational category. Um, you know, if you look at the groups that are larger in terms of uh, claims, uh, the trades, police, public, public transit, fire, office workers, right? So the really big groups are ones that are doing what you would consider to be more physically demanding jobs. Um, and then, you know, you look at public transit. So that's a group where you would have lots of, lots of folks driving, right? And we, we sometimes think of, of driving or sitting in an office as not being particularly physical in nature, but there are still demands associated with sitting. And obviously driving has other demands beyond just sitting. Um, so, you know, what we're going to be talking about today is, is certainly important. And there are injuries that occur to folks, um, while they are driving. Having said that, one trend I often see is um, often the injuries that are reported that are associated with somebody who might be operating a piece of uh, heavy equipment or driving, it doesn't always get tagged to that for the to the activity of driving or operating that piece of equipment. And part of that is, you know, if you think of some of the tasks that are associated with those, so that could be securing loads, right? Loading and unloading cargo. And if we've been seated for a long period of time, that uh, increases our risk. Uh, walking to and from the vehicle, entering and exiting the vehicle. So we, we often will see injuries that are associated with this. It might be classified as a slip, trip, or fall. And then motor vehicle collisions, which of course are not a um, you know, will lead to MSIs, but they're not the type of MSIs that uh, generally an ergonomist is, is looking at preventing. Uh, but you will see, like, if, if, you, if, if you hear that, and I hear that all the time when I'm talking with clients where they've got large numbers of people driving and say, well, you know, we don't really see incidents around driving itself or claims associated with driving. Think of, take a look at what some of those other associated tasks are. And, um, you know, the, the, the number associated with that activity is likely to increase. Okay, so what are some of the common concerns that we hear? Probably the biggest thing in terms of complaints we get from people that are, that are, that are in a vehicle or, or heavy equipment is uh, back concerns. And that is typically associated with extended sitting, right? We spend a lot of time, particularly if, if, you know, you're working an eight or 12 hour shift and, and you know, your, your job is as an equipment operator, you're going to spend the bulk of your time doing that. Um, so the longer we sit, the greater our risk of, of back discomfort. Closely tied to that would be leg discomfort and numbness and or sciatica. And often that comes as a result of, of low back issues. And then the probably the next most common thing we'll hear about is uh, shoulder discomfort. And that would be associated with reaching for technology. It could be the controls in a piece of equipment, or it could be if we've got a, a laptop or other technology in, a, in kind of more of a standard vehicle. Um, those are, are common, common issues we hear about as well. So why is back pain so, so common? Uh, a number of things can, can lead to that. So certainly if, if we're not adopting a good posture, uh, that, that, that increases our risk. Um, we've got improper movement habits. So how we go about either lifting or entering and exiting a vehicle can have an impact. Um, lack of fitness. Uh, I'm not saying we all need to be, you know, uh, athletes to, to prevent back injuries, but we're carrying more weight. 
uh, that does increase our, our risk of, of having a back issue. And then uh, the final one I would add in there is lack of ad adequate recovery between bouts of physical stress. So, you know, if you think back to the, the diagram I had with the blue line and the red line meeting, if we do heavier work, we need more time for our tissues to recover. And, you know, not uncommon, you know, if you think of activities where, where people run into issues, uh, snow shoveling. So most of us don't shovel snow for a, a full-time occupation, but when we get a heavy snowfall, we want to get our driveway cleared and, you know, maybe we, uh, we injure ourselves because we're doing more than we're used to doing and we don't give ourselves enough recovery. Uh, or we're doing yard work in the spring where we haven't been doing stuff and we, you know, we want to get a bunch of stuff done at once and try and power through it and don't give ourselves enough recovery. So same thing can happen, obviously, in an occupational setting as well. If we've got a, an activity that's a little heavier uh, than we're used to and, and, and we do that. So, so back, back issues are, are common um, in lots of settings, whether there's heavy physical labor or um, if we are uh, simply having extended sitting. Uh, so when we look at the stuff today, uh, one of the things I like to highlight is, you know, there's certain things we have control over and certain things we have less control over, but we all still have choices in terms of how we, um, you know, choose to go about our work when we take breaks, making sure we take adequate breaks, getting some movement uh, to break up our day, all those kinds of things. So we need to, need to keep that in mind and, and do what's right for us to minimize our risk. So we look at low risk postures and that's really posture is one of our driving factors. Uh, the more neutral the posture that we can keep, that's gonna reduce our risk of injury. Um, the closer to a, a neutral or midpoint of, uh, of any posture with our joints puts less stress on the ligaments and um, on the muscles and tendons as well. And, um, also, when we're in the mid-range of our uh, joint postures, we have the greatest strength, so we're going to have um, we're going to fatigue less quickly. Whereas if we're at an extreme angle, uh, you know, our arms are fully extended, um, that sort of thing, we can't generate as much force, so we're working a lot harder to generate the same amount of force. So we want to we want to really focus on getting ourselves as close to neutral as possible anytime we're, we're doing an activity. And that's whether we're actually uh, physically lifting something or, or you know, simply sitting in a piece of equipment. So what does a low risk posture look like? Our head should be balanced over our shoulders. We don't wanna be, be tipped forward. Uh, we want to have a neutral spine posture. What I mean by that is our, our torso is fairly upright and we've got our lumbar curve or our lower back supported. We want our shoulders relaxed and our arms at the side of our body. So, you know, kind of the guideline I give people is we want to basically have our elbows underneath our shoulders. If our elbows are in front of our body, uh, you know, the muscles in our shoulders and upper back are, 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 are working harder. We want to have our elbows at about 90 degrees. As I said, when we're in the mid range uh, of, of any uh, joint posture, we, we can generate the greatest force. Um, we want to have an underhand or sideways grip where we can. Uh, it's more work for us to try and grip something overhand. So what I mean by overhand is our hand is on, on top of whatever we're, we're trying to move. Want to make sure we're using two hands whenever we can, particularly for heavier items. We want to keep our wrists straight. And we want to have our feet in a posture that provides lots of stability. So at least at shoulder width. So uh, we're able to, to, to be, maintain a more upright, uh, stable posture. So when we talk about having a neutral back posture, uh, we want to have this gentle S curve. So if you can imagine, uh, the body here is looking towards the right side of the screen. So we've got that gentle S curve. The lower curve is our lumbar curve. Uh, and we want to have that supported. And that's really important when we're sitting in a vehicle or piece of equipment that we have our lumbar curve supported. So when we talk about sitting uh, or lifting with a straight back, it's a little bit of a misnomer in that when our torso is straight, internally, we've got this S curve to our back. And that's really uh, what we want to see in terms of a, a neutral posture. 
So here's a good example of sort of the impact of, of slouching or leaning forward. Um, you know, if we go back to this one, we can see the larger structure here are the vertebrae, the bones in our back, and in between each of the vertebrae are the intervertebral discs. Those are really important because they provide cushioning between the vertebrae uh, as we've got uh, nerves that are coming out from the spinal column that are going to various areas of the body. If we slouch or we twist or have an awkward posture, uh, and you can see kind of in the blow up on the left there, the pressure on those intervertebral discs is not evenly distributed. Uh, so when we do that, uh, we put greater force on those discs and we increase the risk of us compressing those nerves that are coming out from the spinal column. Uh, so picture on the right, you can see we've combined kind of a, you know, a non-neutral posture. We're slouched forward. We combine that with some whole body vibration. And all of a sudden, we, you know, we, we increase our risk of, um, of, of having some back issues. So when we look at setup, and these principles would apply to, to any type of, of vehicle that we're in, there's a number of, a number of things that we want to uh, look at. So traditional vehicle, um, first thing we want to look at is our distance of the seat, right? So when we look at the distance of the seat, we're concerned with being able to reach the pedals, being able to uh, reach the steering wheel, and uh, if we've got, a, if we've got a, a vehicle with an airbag, so most of our uh, traditional vehicles will, will have an airbag in the, in the steering wheel, uh, we want to make sure that we have enough uh, distance for, those, for safe deployment of the airbags. Now, in some vehicles, you're going to have a steering wheel uh, that has some depth and angle adjustment. Some vehicles, you're going to have um, you know, pedals that have a depth adjustment. Uh, but you're not always going to have that. So sometimes we're relying purely on the seat. But as you can imagine, uh, or the seat depth or um, distance adjustment, as you can imagine, if you think back to the what we talked about a couple minutes ago, if we want to try and keep our elbows underneath our shoulders. Um, you know, the shorter we are, the closer we're going to be to that steering wheel to avoid that uh, that reach. You can also think the further we're from that steering wheel, the greater chance that we're driving with our arms fully extended, which is going to, over time, um, increase our risk of, of injury. So distance of, the, distance of the seat or placement of the seat is, is certainly an important starting point. Next thing to look at is the angle of our seat. And, um, you know, this picture on the left is a good example. In a sedan or like a, a car, as opposed to an SUV or a truck, we tend to be seated a little bit more reclined. And, and that's simply to fit us in the height of the vehicle. You know, if we get into an SUV or a truck, uh, the cab tends to be a little higher and we, we can sit a little bit more upright. But in a sedan, it's common that our legs are are extended further in front of us and, and sometimes we are reclined a little bit. Um, now, a couple of things with reclining. Reclining here might be necessary for this individual to sit and not be bumping their head uh, on the ceiling or the roof of the vehicle. Reclining also does help reduce uh, the pressure on the discs in our lower back. The challenge is often when we recline, uh, the steering wheel or whatever we're interacting with gets a little bit further away. So we, we need to kind of balance that off. Now, in this picture, you can see that the individual's elbows are still basically under their shoulders. So they're in a good position and they're, they're not reclined significantly. They're, they're back a few degrees and really their, their hip angle is still probably around 90 degrees. Um, so some vehicles are going to be manual. Some vehicles are going to, you know, have an eight way electric adjustable seat like you see in the picture on the right. Uh, whether it's manual or electric, it, it, it doesn't really matter. We just need to, um, you know, think about the angle of our seat. Uh, and, and if we are reclining, just make sure that we're not uh, reclining so far that we've then introduced a reach with our upper limbs, uh, which we want to avoid. So as I said, you know, when we go from a, a sedan up to an SUV, a truck, and then kind of more in a traditional office setting, in an office setting, we tend to sit very upright. Uh, we might recline a little bit, but we, you know, we don't have a ceiling that's uh, just above our head that we're concerned with, whereas in a sedan, we, we might. So 
Um, posture will vary a little bit depending on the, the size of the vehicle. So once we, you know, we've got in our seat uh, a reasonable distance from uh, the steering wheel, we've reclined however much we have to to get ourselves uh, comfortably underneath the roof line. Uh, next thing we're going to look at is our lumbar curve or making sure that our lumbar curve is supported. So in some vehicles, and if we go back to this vehicle where we've got an eight-way adjustable seat, an electric adjustable seat, chances are pretty good it's going to have uh, an electric or an air bladder for lumbar. Uh, if you've got a manual seat, uh, it might not have an adjustment. Some will have a little knob that you turn that will provide more or less pressure on the low back. Um, if you don't have any of those uh, and you're finding the vehicle doesn't have enough lumbar support, you can use a small towel. Um, you can use an external lumbar support uh, or an external lumbar cushion. Um, there's different versions of those that are out there. A um, couple things to keep in mind with these. If you've got a, an individual that's taller, it might shorten the seat pan too much because it's going to push you forward a little bit in the seat. Uh, if you've got a shorter user and the seat's already a little bit long for them, it might actually be helpful because <laughs> it shortens the seat to a length that's, that's, that works for them. But for taller individuals, sometimes having an external lumbar support um, just makes the seat feel really small for them. Uh, but there are all kinds of different ones out there. If you look on Amazon, if you look on Grand Toy, any, any of those places will have some of these. I would always recommend if you're wanting to try something like this, uh, or if you're considering the purchase of it, you really want a trial to see if it works. So if you can go to something like a shopper's home health or a co-op home health, where they've got some of this stuff and, and you know take it out to your vehicle and see if it's going to fit, that is, um, that's really helpful to be able to do that. Another type of external cushion that we will sometimes use is a wedge cushion. So um, you can kind of see in the picture on the top here where the back of the seat is lower than the front of the seat. And, you know, if you think to somebody sitting in a sedan, uh, quite often that's necessary for them to, uh, to be able to fit in there. But often um, when the back of the seat is lower than the front, obviously it places our hips lower than our knees. And for some individuals that will lead to uh, kind of a closed hip angle where they've got less than 90 degrees. And that can result in a lot of uh, hip discomfort for some people. Now, some seats will, the, angle, the seat is angle adjustable and you can kind of flatten it out. Some seats it's a fixed angle and, and you can't, can't flatten it out. So Something like a wedge cushion essentially just flattens out that seat and you can kind of see it's it's filled in that back portion a bit. Um, very helpful for individuals that are a little bit shorter and they can they can still um, you know sit there and they're not bumping their their head on on the roof. Uh, for users that are a little taller, uh, sometimes this pushes them too high and they either bump their head on the roof or they can't see um, just the, the roof comes down a little bit and imp impacts their, their vision forward. So you've got someone that's got hip issues and you can't adjust the angle of the seat. It's an option to try. Um, again, for taller users might not, uh, might not work. And that's why trialing it is, is really, really important. Another option. So the wedge cushion and the external lumbar supports I've used quite frequently, uh, a seat extension cushion I haven't used, although I, I see where it could be valuable if you've got someone that's got a really long thigh and their seat's kind of short. Uh, essentially, this clamps on to the front of the seat and just extends the seat further. And, um, you know, if you think about it in an office setting, we would suggest you've got a couple fingers between the back of your knee and the front of the seat. Same thing would apply in a vehicle. Uh, if you've got more than a couple fingers, that portion of your leg is going to become tired, right? Because it's not supported, uh, particularly if you're sitting there the whole the whole day. And uh, the point where your the seat ends uh, is going to dig into your leg a little bit. So having having a seat that's adequate in length can could be quite helpful. So um, I can certainly see instances where something like this um, could be could be helpful as well. 
Next thing we want to look at is armrests, if we have them. Sometimes uh, it depends on the vehicle. Sometimes the armrest is just kind of built into the door. Sometimes it's the center console uh, on, the, on the right side of our body. Uh, so not all vehicles will have armrests, but if you do have them, you want to, much like you would in an office environment, set them up so that they are there to support you, but that they're not pushing you into an awkward posture. Um, something that will be adjustable on all vehicles is our mirror. So our rear view mirror, if, if we have one, uh, depending on the style of vehicle, and then our side mirrors. And this is a good example of when, some, when, we're, when we've got shared uh, fleet vehicles and we're not driving the same vehicle every day, this would be part of our vehicle setup, getting our seat set, getting our mirror set, because uh, we use our mirrors quite a bit. And if they're set uh, in such a way that we're bending further forward than we need to, that's going to put us into an awkward posture uh, more frequently than we need to when we could simply adjust the mirrors to allow us to, to check those uh, in a more neutral posture. It's an easy, doesn't take long to do. But over the number of times that we check our mirrors during the day, really important that we do that. In terms of other setup considerations, keeping our hands low on the steering wheel will be helpful. Uh, typically, we hear nine and you know nine and three. Some people will 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 operate at uh, you know kind of more ten and two. Obviously, as we're turning, we're gonna you know we're not we're not always staying in those positions, but um, the lower we can keep our hands on the steering wheel where we still have control. I'm not suggesting, you know, you have your hands at, uh, at five and seven or anything, but, uh, having them lower just puts our shoulders into a more neutral, uh, position. And then obviously when we're turning and depending on what we're doing, um, that hand position is going to change as well. All right. So some examples of, uh, the impact of posture and the things that we can do to try and um, get ourselves into a better posture. Here's a, a compare and contrast of a, a, a poor and a neutral neck posture. So the more upright that we can be, um, the less strain that's placed on the muscles in our the back of our neck and our upper body. And so an example where we might run into issues here, if we've got someone who's really tall in a smaller vehicle, or if the vehicle's got a low roof line, uh, we'll sometimes run into this for the person's got a slouch to be able to see out. That vehicle is not going to be appropriate for them for an extended period of time. So we might need to look at something that's got a taller cab and allows them to stay uh, more upright. Uh, when we're looking at shoulders, we want to basically be working below shoulder height. Anything above shoulder height is difficult for us to do. Um, we want to have our uh, elbows at our side, elbows at about 90 degrees, anything that will keep us in a more neutral. And obviously, we're seeing somebody do something a little bit more manual here, but if you think about it as it relates to um, sitting in a vehicle, the more that we can do to position ourselves, our steering wheel, our distance of our seat, all those things, all those things will be helpful. We look at hands and wrists. Uh, you know, we see the posture on the top. We can see our wrist is extended here. We're not able to keep our wrist straight compared to a uh, picture on the bottom where we're able to keep a nice neutral straight wrist posture. Um, that is going to help us uh, feel better at the end of the day, the more we are in that posture. Okay. So other activities that we do, entering and exiting the vehicle is certainly a, a high risk time for um, for uh, issues to occur. We want to make sure we've got three points of contact. You know, snow and ice are gone away now, hopefully. Uh, but with wet weather, we can have mud on our boots, all those kinds of things. Maintaining three points of contact is, is quite important. Um, other things that will uh, increase our risk, whole body vibration. Okay. Now, now, whole body vibration is something where you need to, like, you can tell whether there is vibration or not in the vehicle, whether it's going to have an impact or not, you would need to do a, a vibration study to, to determine uh, what the impact of that is. But essentially, the higher the vibration, the longer the exposure, the greater the risk of injury. Um, and then prolonged uninterrupted uh, sitting is quite hard. So, 
getting, and I know for people that are, that are operating all day, getting them to get into the habit of making sure they are getting out, uh, you know, hopefully at least once an hour briefly to move around is, is really quite important. Um, you know, even on an individual basis, if you think about it, we're into the summer, we're kind of into more kind of road trip season, making sure that we are uh, taking those breaks um, when we have the opportunity or making sure that we do take the opportunity to do that. Okay. Um, so how we talked about some high risk activities. Here's uh, low risk, how we improve that. Maintaining the three points of contact as we see on the top here, making sure we adjust our seat before we get going. Um, if we are on a particularly rough piece of road, uh, driving slowly can help minimize our vibration. Okay, making sure that we're getting out adequately. Um, tire pressure has a big impact on what level of vibration we're having, particularly in, in heavy equipment. So making sure that that is correct. And then reporting equipment that's not functioning. Uh, we, we see that often in, in organizations where there's lots of shared fleet vehicles where people say, ah, oh, the seat's broken, nobody ever fixes it. So I've just stopped saying something. Well, if you don't note that something is broken, it's definitely not getting fixed. So um, you know, really encouraging people to uh, note items that are broken or not functioning and, and following up to make sure that it's, it's getting the maintenance that it should be. Um, so other items for driving. If we have been driving or operating a piece of equipment for an extended period of time, the longer we sit, the more, the more our back and our, you know, our soft tissue kind of adjusts to that seated posture. We, our body needs a bit of time to adjust to standing and, and doing physical activity. So um, having a quick walk around the vehicle, it's a good opportunity to do a quick, uh, quick inspection of our vehicle, uh, look for any hazards before we start doing whatever we might need to do, rather than simply hopping out of our vehicle and starting to do stuff right away. Because uh, if we do that, we're certainly at, uh, at greater risk. Okay. We look at equipment inspection, and this would be, you know, a regular occurrence, uh, typically at the beginning of our shift, looking at high risk postures. Um, you know, sometimes you see an example here, where we're reaching over shoulder height. Uh, we've got uh, twisted postures. We've got our arms fully extended. All those things are, are items that are going to put us at greater risk. Um, if we can get as close to uh, what we're looking at as possible, uh, making sure we're maintaining uh, a nice neutral back posture. So we can see in the picture on the left here, this person's bent down, but they're still maintaining their straight back, right? And their, uh, their weight of their torso is still over their, their feet and, and their knees. They've got their knees nicely bent. So just encouraging people to, even though it might be a very short time that they're in these postures, that keeping it in a good posture is still really important. Okay. Um, and we can see some other different examples here of, you know, maintaining a good posture when we're, when we are opening up that hood, uh, using, uh, different, different postures, uh, to, um, to be able to open that hood, but still keep ourselves in a, in a nice, powerful posture, I think is, uh, is quite important. And, you know, considering our stature for, uh, if we're really short or really tall, how we attack this might be different and, and encouraging, um, you know, people to, to adopt a posture that works well for the, the stature that they have. Okay. Other things we can do, um, we can look at, particularly if people are, um, are, are doing tasks beyond driving and, and you know what, even if they are uh, primarily in uh, their vehicle, looking at a dynamic warm up, right? So getting some movement, uh, not stretching necessarily, but getting our muscles working, getting some blood flow going, um, getting our flexibility uh, in a better spot, and just encouraging that blood flow. Particularly if we have been sitting for an extended period of time where our blood flow is not as great, using something like a dynamic warm up is is quite helpful and. Um, there is information for those of you that aren't familiar. AMSHA does have a dynamic warm up program. Um, there's lots of information on the website. I would encourage you to check that out afterwards if you're not familiar with it. So, um, as I mentioned, one of the greatest risks associated with operating equipment or, or vehicles is 
that we are in uh, static postures for a lot of the time. Uh, so the best thing we can do there, making sure that static posture is as neutral as possible and uh, making sure that we do get some movement to encourage blood flow. Um, it's not so much about stretching as it is just getting that blood flowing. Um, you know, if you're sitting, if you've been sitting here listening to this or standing watching the webinar, unless you're moving around, there's nothing that encourages blood flow. And uh, if we don't have that blood flow, um, our muscles don't get the oxygen and nutrients that they need and the waste products don't get taken away. So important that we, um, that we encourage that. Um, just wanted to talk about a couple of manual handling things here before we wrap up. Um, cause often what happens, um, is when we, uh, when we do go to lift something or if we, you know, if we are doing physical activity after we've been off operating a piece of equipment, um, is, as I said, if we, if we've been static for a long period of time, our, our risk of injury is, is increased. One of the things I always like to highlight when we talk about, um, about any manual handling, and this would even apply to a lot of our inspection tasks, particularly when we're looking at low level uh, things. So we're looking at our tires, looking at our undercarriage, that kind of stuff. So we need to remember that when we go to lift something, whether we're lifting it or not, uh, when we bend forward, we are also lifting the weight of our torso, right? So uh, even if our hands are empty and we saw it in some of those postures previously, um, you know, we are still lifting the weight of our torso when, when we bend over and we're doing kind of low level work. So important to, to keep that weight as much as we can centered and back and upright and um, make sure that even if we aren't uh, lifting as such, people are thinking of, but I, but I am still lifting. My trunk is still doing work uh, when I am uh, adopting some of those postures. Um, so here again, uh, compare and contrast. Picture on the left, we've got that gentle S curve. Uh, picture on the right, we are, um, you know, we've got our back rounded out and we're not in a good uh, position. So we want to we want to avoid that. Other things when it comes to manual handling, we want to avoid twisting. We saw that, uh, you know. A couple of times in, in some of the pictures when people were doing their equipment inspection where they're twisted to try and uh, get in to see something or they just aren't, aren't making the effort to turn their feet. Always want to squarely face what we're, what we're looking at and what we're evaluating. Uh, and it's just a good habit to get into whether we are simply looking at or whether we're actually lifting like we see in this example. And then um, we want to keep the object close to us. Uh, so, you know, whether we're operating controls or actually physically lifting something, the closer things are, the more we keep our postures neutral and, uh, the better it is for us. So the final thing I wanted to go over, and then I'm happy to answer any questions everyone has. So I wanted to talk about fleet acquisition. So as you notice, uh, I, I, I sort of illustrated a number of different add-on things that we can do to seats to try and make them work. Um, you know, basically once you have a vehicle, the ability to swap out the seat is, 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 is limited. There's only certain models of seats that, that are going to be appropriate for the vehicle you have. Uh, purchasing a seat as, you know, just a standalone item is much more expensive than simply getting you know, a higher grade of seat uh, when you start to purchase a vehicle or piece of equipment. So when we're going to acquire equipment is when we really need to um, put our best effort at getting what we need from the beginning. Um, so first thing I suggest is looking at what does and does not work in a current piece of equipment and asking the people that use it every day, they, they will tell you <laughs> right there. They're, they're in there all the time. They know what what does and, and doesn't work. Uh, so very important to do that. Um, you know, if, if you're having, if you're looking for a, a objective or you need kind of more backing on that, certainly having an ergonomics assessment of that piece of equipment uh, can, can help that. But I, I can tell you that, you know, 90% of the time, what the folks that are using it every day are telling you is an issue will, will, will probably end up being 
uh, noted in, in, in an ergo assessment. Now, ergonomic assessment is going to be a little bit more objective. Um, it's not using just subjective information, but um, I guess the point is if, if people are complaining about a particular piece of equipment, there's probably a, there's probably a reason for it. When we go to purchase something, we want to make sure that the cab and seat accommodates the greatest range of users from the beginning. As I said, changing out a seat uh, is not always the easiest. And really, you know, the cab, the size of the cab is the size of the cab. So, we, you know, you can't change that with an aftermarket purchase. Uh, you can get a seat that might have more adjustability, uh, but even that can be, can be quite expensive. So you want to want to get as best an item as you can to begin with. And then the final thing I would say, and obviously there's more considerations than what I've listed here, but just kind of talking at a high level, uh, the placement of stored items is really um, important, um, particularly items that are frequently accessed or that are taken every day. You know, uh, we see it where someone's got a king cab vehicle and the back is just jammed full of stuff. And then that impacts their ability to adjust the seat or make the full range of, of seat adjustments because there's too much storage that needs to happen inside. So thinking about what gets used, where it's gonna be placed, uh, also how it's gonna be accessed, right? Whether it's uh, um, you know ab above the side of, a, of the back of the truck or whether it's gonna be from the actual back, the height that it's gonna be accessed at, um, all those things play into um, sort of that discussion around acquisition. So you want to you wanna look at what you have and then make plans for what you're going to get. And, and if you need some professional advice, I would, I would encourage you to seek that. But, um, and one of the challenges with acquisition of anything, whether it's a vehicle or a, an office chair or a new um, you know, building, there's always competing constraints, right? Or competing interests. Uh, Number one is usually cost. Uh, and then we look at all the other performance metrics that you might have. So the ergonomics is one of many things that, that you want to consider, but it's one of the things that's kind of hardest to change after you purchase it. Um, so I really, really encourage you to, to, to look into that early, early on when you're acquiring equipment. Uh, so a little bit of information about us there. And, and again, Rob will, will share that uh, by email as well. Uh, but I wanted to stop there and uh, answer any questions you might have.